This is the discussion on angina pectoris. Angina. When I say angina, angina corresponds to chest pain or pressure in the anterior chest, oftentimes referred to as strangling of the chest. Take note that the cause is insufficient coronary blood flow. And because of insufficient coronary blood flow, there is decrease of oxygen supply towards the parts of your myocardium or your heart. Take note that the ischemia or lack of oxygen that occurs in your angina is limited and does not cause permanent damage of myocardial tissue, unlike in your myocardial infarction that the damage may already be permanent. Now, when I say angina, angina is more of a symptom rather than a disease process itself. Angina could be caused by ischemia. Ischemia is the lack of oxygen and is also considered to be the primary symptom of your coronary artery disease and myocardial infarction. Take note that your angina is caused by the increase in the demand of oxygen in proportion to the supply of oxygen. And this again can be brought by the obstruction in your blood vessels. Other than the obstruction of your blood vessels, it can be brought also by excessive exercises, because that increases your oxygen demand. It can also be brought by the decrease of oxygen if you are in high altitudes. If you would look at this pathophysiology, this goes back to the manifestation of our coronary artery disease. So take note, the presence of your atherosclerotic heart disease or obstruction to any of the two major arteries, for example, your left coronary artery, your right coronary artery, or any of its branches could result to myocardial ischemia. Because of that myocardial ischemia, there will be chest pain or angina. There are several types of angina. For stable, take note of the keywords predictable and consistent. It's referred to as stable because it is predictable, consistent, occurs with exertion, and relieved by rest. That's why it's considered to be predictable. There is a pattern. It is occurring during exertion and it is relieved by stress. Oftentimes, it is also relieved by nitroglycerin. Your nitroglycerin is considered to be a vasodilator. As a vasodilator, it improves the blood flow towards that affected part of your heart. Unstable angina. When I say unstable, it is referred to as pre-infarction or crescendo angina, and the symptoms increase in frequency and severity. It may not be relieved by rest and nitroglycerin. Next, intractable and refractory angina. Intractable. When we say intractable pain, it is severe incapacitating chest pain. Then, you have your prince metals or variant angina. For your prince metal angina, it is a pain at rest with reversible ST segment elevation. Okay, there is ST segment elevation. However, the more important word for you to remember is it is thought to be caused by coronary artery vasospasm. That's why for the management of your prince metal angina, what we give is anti-vasospastic agents to relieve the vasospasm. So when I say vasospasm, there is an alteration or there is an alternating constriction and dilation of your blood vessels. So we give antispasmodic agents for your blood vessels to address your variant angina. Then you have your silent ischemia. As the term implies, silent, meaning there is an objective finding of ischemia. There is a change in the ECG which shows ischemia. However, the patient is not showing chest pain. Oftentimes, this type of ischemia is only detected in routine ECG workup for your patient as an incidental finding. Chest pain could be precipitated by the following factors. 1. Physical exertion. Your physical exertion increases your myocardial demand. 2. Exposure to cold. Exposure to cold causes vasoconstriction and elevation of your blood pressure. With that, it also increases your oxygen demand. Third, eating of a heavy meal. Eating of a heavy meal causes the blunt, the blood, I mean, to shunt to your mesenteric area. Your mesenteric area is the blood supply for your abdominal organs. With that, it reduces the blood flow to your heart. Next, stress or any provoking situations or any emotion provoking situations. So these situations would cause the release of your catecholamines. Catecholamines increases your blood pressure, increases your heart rate. In the long run, it increases your myocardial workload, hence stressing your heart. Assessment findings for angina would include heaviness, tightness, squeezing, vice-like pain or crushing pain. Oftentimes, the patient would describe it to be present in the center of the chest and then in the retrosternal area. 
Okay, oftentimes they will say they are, have the feeling of heavy choking. The pain is poorly localized, which means that the patient is unable to point it with one finger. And then it can radiate down to your arms. It's usually it's the left arm. It can also radiate to the shoulder, neck, jaw, or back. The patient would often complain of the feeling of impending doom, and during the attack, they would be pale, diaphoretic, and dysnic. Unique to your angina is that the chest pain is brought about by the exertion and relieved by rest and vasodilator agent. The common vasodilator agent being used is your nitroglycerin. Let's talk about diabetes and chest pain. One complication of your diabetes is your DM neuropathy. Neuropathy, meaning the neurons are affected. This could, this could cause blunt nociceptor transmission. In other words, the pain perception of the patient is impaired. So oftentimes, your patient with diabetes may have chest pain. However, they are not feeling it properly because of the DM neuropathy. So again, take note that in diabetes, there is decreased pain perception, even in chest pain. What are the laboratory and diagnostic tests for your angina? One is ECG. Your ECG may indicate signs of ischemia. Signs of ischemia may include T-wave inversion, ST segment elevation, and development of abnormal Q-wave. Then you have your exercise stress test. You can also have your echocardiogram to show the structural problems. Then you have C-reactive protein which is a marker for the inflammation of your vascular endothelium. So again, your C-reactive protein is a marker of inflammation. Then you have coronary angiography to map the blood vessels of your heart. And then you have your cardiac catheterization, which can also aid in coronary angiography. Drug therapy for angina. One is nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin or your nitrates are considered to be vasodilators. Being a vasodilator, it would improve the blood flow to your heart, hence improving the oxygen supply to your heart. Other than that, it can also reduce your myocardial oxygen consumption. Secondary to that effect also, it causes dilation of your veins. Other than dilation of the arteries, it can also cause dilation of your veins. Because of the dilation of the veins, it could result to the venous pooling of the blood throughout the body, meaning the blood stays on the peripheral aspect of the body. Because of this, there is less blood that goes towards your heart. And because of the decrease of blood that goes back to your heart, you are decreasing the preload of your patient. Hence, decreasing the workload of the heart. Your nitrates could be given in several forms. It could be sublingual, oral, topical, or IV. The most common ones used for the management of angina is administered sublingual. In the hospital setting, it may be administered also topically okay, using your nitroglycerin patch. Take note that the sublingual dose of your nitrate could relieve the chest pain in 3 minutes or within 3 minutes. Before giving nitrates to your patient, one of the nursing responsibility is to check the blood pressure of the patient because your nitrates could result to hypotension. The next drug is your beta blockers. Your beta blockers, examples of which is your metoprolol, atenolol. These medications could reduce your myocardial oxygen consumption by blocking your beta 2. Take note, your beta 2 adrenergic receptor acts primarily in your heart. It can cause increase in your heart rate. It can also increase your cardiac contractility. However, we are giving beta blockers to decrease your heart rate. If the heart rate is reduced, okay, there will be slowing of the conduction of the impulses through your SA node, AV node, and your Purkinje fibers. There will be a decrease of blood pressure and reduced myocardial contractility. In other words, we are decreasing the workload of the heart to decrease the oxygen demand of your heart hence reducing the chest pain experienced by your patient. However, take note, beta blocker is an antihypertensive medication, meaning if your patient has hypotension, you must not give this drug. Okay, other side effects, depressed mood, fatigue, libido decrease, dizziness, and it could even mask signs of hypoglycemia, meaning your beta blocker should also be given with caution among your patients with diabetes mellitus. Next, we have your calcium channel blockers. Your calcium channel blockers are considered to be calcium ion antagonist, okay? meaning it combats the action of your calcium. Recall that your calcium is very important for the action potential. With your calcium channel blocker, your calcium channel blocker will inhibit your action potential. 
meaning it would decrease your SA node automaticity and your AV node conductivity. With that, the heart rate is being decreased. With the decrease of your heart rate or the decrease of your contractions, there will be a decrease in your oxygen demand of the heart. Okay. Other than that, one particular effect of calcium channel blockers not done by the other medications is to decrease vasospasms. Okay, it can decrease your vasospasm. It can prevent your vasospasms. Hence, it makes it to be the drug of choice for your Prince Metal angina. Because recall earlier that your Prince Metal or your variant angina is caused by vasospasm. Okay, side effect also, this is an antihypertensive, examples of which are your amlodipine, you have your nifidipine, you have diltiazem, and verapamil. Being an antihypertensive, you need to watch out for hypotension. You are not supposed to give this drug or you need to be cautious if your patient has an AV block or your atrioventricular block. That would mean that there is a problem between the transmission of firing from your SA node to your AV node. So your calcium channel blocker might aggravate that problem. So we need to be cautious. Bradycardia also has a common side effect, so as constipation. Then you have your antiplatelet and anticoagulant medication. Take note that your thrombus or your clot could also impair on the blood flow, could also impair the blood flow towards your myocardium. So to prevent clot formation among your patients who are at risk for clot formation, we give medications such as your aspirin, clopidogrel, heparin, and your low molecular weight heparin, example of which is your enoxaparin. So these medications are given to prevent platelet aggregation and prevent thrombus formation. Since these are antiplatelet medications, one side effect that you need to watch out for is bleeding. Next, you also have your then we also have your glycoprotein 2B and 3A medications. These medications prevent platelet aggregation, commonly used among hospitalized patients who have unstable angina, and adjunct therapy for your percutaneous coronary interventions. You also have your statins, such as your atorvastatin, so they can re reduce your uh, blood cholesterol levels. Then you have your ACE inhibitors. Take note that your ACE or your angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor. In our patients with angina, we don't want potent vasoconstrictors because they can increase the blood pressure of our patient. They can increase the workload of our heart. Hence, we are giving ACE inhibitors. Your ACE inhibitor would prevent the conversion of your angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, hence decreasing the blood pressure of your patient. So, common example of this one is your captopril. Then, oxygen administration. Remember that our main problem is the decrease of oxygen supply in proportion to the oxygen demand. So, we need to give oxygen to our patient. Then, we need to monitor the O2 saturation of our patient. Normal O2 saturation should be 95% at room air. Then, we can have complementary and alternative medicine, depending on the advice of the physician. So these uh, plants or herbs were known to have effects on angina. However, it is still recommended to be under the advice of a physician. Possible nursing diagnosis for this patient, one is acute pain. So if their patient is having acute pain or complaints of chest pain, one of your nursing intervention is to stop all activities that can stress the client, place the client in semi-fowler's position to increase oxygen supply through lung expansion, and then reduce the requirement of the myocardium when it comes to the workload. So do not stress the patient. Measure the vital signs, okay, all the vital signs of your patient. Start oxygen. As a nurse, you can start oxygen at 2 liters per minute. And then, if the physician has a PRN order for this medication, nitroglycerin, you give your nitroglycerin as advice, okay, as long as there is no hypotension. Then there could be risk for decreased cardiac output. There could also be anxiety or fear. Take note that your anxiety and fear is brought about by the chest pain. They do not know what causes the chest pain. They are more anxious of what might be the result of the chest pain. So they, you need to educate your patient. You need to make them calm. You need to give them information of illness if they are not already on the acute stage of chest pain. You give the treatment and then you give them relaxation techniques or teach them relaxation techniques to reduce their stress and to reduce the production of your catecholamines. Then spiritual care may help your patient. Then you have deficient knowledge which can be addressed of course by 
education. This will be the end of your discussion in Angina Pictoris.